Now and then I would run into a director who was very conscious that I was a female and therefore he must not give me my way or let me play the scene the way I wanted to. But uh, that never discouraged me. We ended up playing it the way I wanted to. Wow. I am so happy to have Cindy Cowan here today. You, I was going to say are, because we're still going into the next year. You are the 2019 Hollywood Women's Film Festival Humanitarian of the Year, correct? I am. And it is such an honor to have you today. And I don't want to spend a lot of time because you have so much going on, not only in your life right now, but what you have built over just the course of your career. And we want to celebrate that today well, and talk you. a lot more about that. And so my first question, and even if you want to take me further back, you can, but I want to know a little bit about Initial Entertainment Group. You started this in 1995. And I, I want to know why you thought that this was important for you to start this group. I came to Hollywood the year before and um, left Florida, which is where I was from. I, at the time, got into the business through news um, where I started um, associate producing the evening news out of Miami, Florida. And when I came to Hollywood and started learning a little bit about what Hollywood was and how it was working, I discovered that there was going to be an area that was missing. At the time, there really wasn't independent film companies like you see today. There were the studios, and to show you how different the times have been from 1995 to now, studio films were films that were $10 million and more. And independent films were films that were $3 million and less. And there was nobody making these films in the middle. There were two companies that kind of were going in that direction. One was a company named Miramax, and the other was a company named New Line Cinema. And what ended up happening was Miramax got bought by Disney, and New Line got bought by Turner. And I was just sitting there one day going, well, who's going to replace them? There's a hole in the market now. Everybody tried to talk me out of it. Everybody said, if you make movies in the 5 to $7 million range, you will go broke. And I just said, well, let me try. You know, so Initial Entertainment Group was born out of me seeing a necessity and a hole in the market that I thought I could fill, and um, it worked. Yeah. Wow, amazing. And you've had some great films come underneath this umbrella. We'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the things that we find with women in Hollywood is that there are a lot of challenges. And you mentioned one challenge where everyone said, told you, how are you going to do that? And you did it. But can you think of some of your biggest challenges that you faced as a woman um, heading this you know, independent company doing all of these films and television shows? I don't really view my sex is a challenge. I know that some people want to go down that road and I actually, think that it's actually helped me in many ways. Um, you know, a lot of people want to say, oh, poor me, and we're female, and this, that, and the other. Let me tell you something. Being a female gets you in a door. The only thing that's different is you better be prepared once those doors close behind you. And I mean, you're in the room now. So I think a lot of girls maybe will just use their feminine femininity or whatever to get in a room, and then they have no idea what they're doing in there. I always found you better know what you're talking about. And um, I went in knowing my stuff. So I never viewed it as a challenge. I really didn't. There were some incidences maybe on sets that the male directors and maybe other male producers or financiers didn't quite know where I fit. Um, I was one of only two girls at the time that were also female distributors. There were none of, other of us. There was a girl named Kathy Morgan and myself at the time. And um, Nobody really knew what to do with us. Um, you know, sometimes I would go to a set and people would be looking around like, where's your husband or where's your, 
boyfriend or who financed you to get here. Um, and again, it's just knowing your stuff. So as um, soon as they realize, oh, it's just, it's you. Um, I don't know. I, I used it as an advantage. I, you know, I wasn't competing with all the guys. There's many of you. I'm the only girl here. So um, I embrace it. And that's a great, that's a great way of looking at it. And I actually want to ask you a follow-up question because you mentioned a key word here is embracing it. Yes. And what advice can you give to someone who's already in the industry, but is looking at their gender and they're thinking it's a challenge and they haven't made that step forward to embrace it? What would you tell them? Well, now the time to be a woman or a woman of color or a woman of any kind of ethnicity is actually a good thing, not a bad thing. So when I came about, it wasn't necessarily a good thing. And the fact that, like I said, you had to be a little bit smarter than maybe the male in the room if you were going to take that step forward. Nowadays, Hollywood, more than anybody, is embracing differences. Diversity and inclusion is a very big thing. So if you were a girl and you were a girl of any kind of ethnicity whatsoever, you actually have an advantage right now. So again, my thing is know your craft, whether you're a DP, a director, a writer, we are all embracing it. And so now's your time. Um, so it, it's actually a good thing. That's such great advice. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask you about the two uh, films that's underneath your umbrella. And I want to ask you about a film in the past. Okay. And I want to ask you about a film that just won an Emmy, right? Yeah. Okay. And you probably know which two I'm talking about. But first, I want to talk about Traffic. Okay. Because that was such a phenomenal film. It was, it was controversial. It was ahead of its time when it, when it came to filmmaking. And I want to know what about that project attracted Cindy to it? Because you were, you did probably, you probably realized at the time, you were changing the way Hollywood was doing movies. Yeah. Traffic was an interesting project because it had been around for 11 years. Um, for 11 years, nobody in town wanted to make that movie. And when it came to me, it had a very different budget and a very different cast. My cast was Michael Douglas, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Benicio Del Toro. God, I think when it came to me, there was a Nicolas Cage version. There was a Tommy Lee Jones version. There was all these different versions of the film. There was a much bigger budget of it. I, at the time, was getting ready to sell my company. Um, I got very lucky. I sold Initial um, a couple of months before September 11th. And, you know, uh, I was so lucky that I sold it at the time that I did. I was looking for a film to sell my company on because I wanted to see if I could raise the, the, the price on the stock market. And um, traffic came and um, I went to my partner at the time, a man named Graham King, and I said, this is it. And um, Steven Soderbergh is an incredible director. We quickly redid the budget and bought this amazing talent on board. Nobody was sure if it was going to get received the way it did. In fact, when we went out to sell the film in the domestic market, people weren't running for it. Um, you know, you'd think that there was this huge bidding where there wasn't. We sold the film and obviously got Oscar nominations and ultimately won four Oscars. But it was one of those things that nobody was really sure. They hadn't seen a movie shot this way. It was about, you know, drug trafficking and topics that nobody really wanted to deal with at the time. But it was an interesting film. It paved the way for films like that in the future. I got very lucky with another controversial film, which was called Very Bad Things. Um, it was a film with Cameron Diaz, John Favreau, Jeremy Piven, Daniel Stern. It was a huge cast. Um, but we were so controversial at the time. It was very warped and weird. I gave Peter Berg his first directorial ever in, in directing this movie. And ultimately, it paved the way for movies like The Hangover and um, movies like that, which were almost direct rip-offs of my movie, but we were, we were just ahead of the game. Nobody was really sure with that movie either. What do we do with it? So, you know, I like to consider myself a bit of a trailblazer. I'm, I've never been one to just follow others. Um, you know, let me pave the way. It's not so easy sometimes cutting the trees down to make a path for others, but someone's got to do it. So I'm proud to be the one. Amazing. So let's continue the path of trailblazing. I just saw the trailer for Miracle on 42nd Street, 
and I didn't even know what to expect until I saw it. And I saw you had incredible interviewees like Angela Lansbury, Alicia Keys, Terrence Howard, but wow, what a right. on a documentary. Yeah. So what is Cindy thinking when she's coming, when she decides to go with this documentary? Um, so a, a good friend of mine named Mary Jo Slater, who is Christian Slater's mom, called me up, God, it was, I don't even know how many years ago. Documentaries take a long time. I don't know if, know if it was five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, it was a long time. And she and Christian had actually lived in this building. And her thing at the time was, people need to know about this building. And for anybody out there that doesn't know what this building is, it was a building that was resurrected in Harlem, basically, in, the Har in, in Harlem in New York City. And it was done so that the wealthy would move to this area of Harlem. And so nothing was spared when they built this building. There's swimming pools, there's tennis courts, there's a recording studio, the apartments are luxurious. It was done so that the wealthiest of wealthy would come down here. And then they didn't. People were like, that's great that building's there. We're not moving to Harlem. So the building sat empty for years until one day, I believe it was a congressman who said, we still want to gentrify this area. We need to get people into this building. So they decided to hold open auditions where actors and musicians and anybody could come and they would literally audition for an apartment under the guise that you would then, once you made it, you would pay like a manager, um, a commission back, and that would pay for your apartment. And the various people that you named, I mean, everybody from Mickey Rourke, um, Larry David, who is Seinfeld, obviously, um, Kramer, the, the, the gentleman that Larry David created Kramer um, about lived in the building, Christian Slater, Alicia Keys, Sam Jackson, um, I, I can't even remember, Terrence Howard, um, God, the list goes on and on and on of the people that came out of this building. Um, what was amazing about this building is it was also the AIDS capital of the world when AIDS came about. And there was more AIDS per square footage in this building alone. And again, they tried to shut the building down and everybody said, no, we will take care of our own. Do not shut us down. We need to be here. And the building thrived. Um, you, they would only hire homeless people. So everybody that is working there I was homeless at one point. And the reason that I really, really, really wanted to be a part of it is until all this craziness started happening, um, our desire was to try to replicate this building in every state in the United States. If it worked there, we should be able to replicate it elsewhere. But one of the amazing things about this documentary, documentaries are so hard to make. I ended up on a plane going to New York City to see this building for the first time. And I usually don't speak to people on planes. I'm one of those girls that I put the headphones on, I make sure I'm wearing glasses, I start reading right away, meaning don't speak to me who's ever sitting next to me. It's a long flight to get to New York and um, usually I just don't wanna be bothered. For whatever reason, this particular day, the man sitting next to me got, got me before, before the headphones got on or whatever. We ended up in this huge conversation at the end of which, when we landed, the man said, and why are you coming to New York? What brings you here this time? And I said, I'm actually going to see this building. We got in a huge conversation about the building and he ended up writing the first check for $100,000 um, that went into making this documentary. Unfortunately, he passed away before the documentary came out, but his son's name is listed on the movie and um, we just won an Emmy in his father's name. So it's an incredible, kind of story of even how it came to be um, and many years in the making. Wow, that's yeah. such an incredible story. Yeah. Now, just, I just, and I didn't see it, but if someone wants to see Miracle on 42nd Street, where can, can they see that right now? It's supposed to be on Amazon. I think it was on PBS, it was on Yahoo. Um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of different places. I think if you Google Miracle on 42nd, it'll list all the places that it is. Because it's just a wonderful documentary that you think it, you definitely want to show yeah. in education, definitely there. Yeah. So you mentioned this crazy time. So I'm just making an assumption what the crazy time is. This is what we're all doing right now, and it's why we're doing this podcast remotely, um, the pandemic. And so my question is, is I know that you have two films that uh, are they green lighted, uh, 
ready for production. And I want to know how is what we're going through right now, how is that impacting your two films? And I want to hear a little more about them as well so we can watch for them when they come out. I've actually got um, four films, but two are with Sony Studios. I was supposed to be filming right now in South Africa. Um, we were supposed to be doing pre-production in May and we were supposed to be actually filming as we speak. Um, and I don't honestly know if we will go before next year, which, you know, I, I'm definitely not saying, oh, poor me, because even if we don't go to next year, I will be able to eat. Um, this pandemic and coupled now with these protests and riots and everything that is happening in America is so terrifying to me. And my heart is just breaking for people because um, I don't know how people are going to eat and survive. In the film business, um, we are all looking at the guidelines that are coming in. And a lot of the guidelines say that we won't be able to use more than 20 people on a set at any time. I usually have 120 people on my sets. So if every set that goes and the billions of dollars that go into the entertainment business, if all of those jobs are reduced to 20 people max, I don't know how these second ADs or the even the extras or any of the people that are utilized, like we can no longer have craft services on a set. You'll be able to get food delivered, but there'll be prepackaged that'll just be given. But normally a craft service department, which is the food, you know, might have three or four people serving the food. Makeup departments might have five or six people. They're now saying I can have, we can have one. Um, the actors will bring their own makeup. Um, even stylists might not be needed because the actors might have to bring, you know, use their own clothes. Um, I know in Australia right now, they're not using any extras. They're trying to use the DPs and the camera guys and, and um, the first ADs and whatever to be the actual extras. So this going forward is going to impact in such a big way. Also, the smaller independent movies, we now have to have these huge coronavirus insurance packages in place which you know a lot of people are saying well this virus will be great for independent movies because we can do a movie on with 20 people yes and no we have to quarantine my entire crew for two weeks in advance with the coronavirus task force person sitting there a lot of these independents don't have enough money to put 20 people up in a hotel for two weeks and then drive them back and forth in a very limited capacity to a set and then for me, my next four movies are all supposed to go outside of America. But first of all, we have borders closed, so we can't go even if we wanted to. Second of all, none of my actors, and me included, necessarily want to get on a plane to go to a country if the pandemic's not over, where I don't know where the, where the hospitals are. Um, and nobody wants an American right now, which is sad. Greece just released that they're opening their borders, and they specifically said, to everybody but America, the UK, and um, Brazil. So um, couple that with the fact that we've got these amazing protesters and I stand with all of them, um, but the virus isn't over and we've got hundreds of thousands of people crammed together. And if that makes the, our, the, the amount of cases in America go up, um, it makes the borders stay shut. And um, it's really going to affect everybody in my business. It really is. Everybody's saying, well, the streamers will all be buying. The streamers have to keep going. The streamers need content. Yes and no. They do need content. We're all in front of Netflix and Amazon and doing our Disney+. Plus. The difference is, if people aren't going to the movie theaters, then like my two movies at Sony, which would normally come out theatrical, we might make a deal with Netflix. And so... The streamers will be getting a lot of the studio films because we have to come out somehow. So um, it's just going to be a very different business going forward. And it, it sounds like that. And it sounds like with even how you've been able to process everything and the changes, but it just shows with your entire career, you've always learned to embrace those changes and move forward but it does, it sounds like a lot of challenges for you. Yeah. And we, we talked about the movie field and, and what you've been doing in the film industry, but that's just only one side of Cindy. 
The other side of Cindy is that you believe in so many different causes and yeah. you volunteer for so many different charities. And I wanted to spend some time talking about that. The first one I want to talk about is the World Women's Foundation. And I found out that they actually have a goal of, I'm, look, I wanna read it because I wanna make sure I'm exact, one million women and girls will be a mentoring programs for one mil million women and girls worldwide by 2030. That's only 10 years from now. I mean, that's so aggressive, yes. but it, it's obvious that this foundation is so dear to your heart. Yes. And so why is this important to you? I, I just, I love it. <laughs> this is one of the, you know, it's funny because I've been unfortunately and sadly having to turn down most charities now. I, I get hit up daily because a lot of people know me as being so charitable. And right now, I think like many of us who want to do good and are, are used to raising money and helping charity, we're being pulled in so many directions, including by just individuals that we know that are going to be struggling in this time, that um, I pretty much said no to the majority of them as far as going on additional boards until this one. This is something that I just came on board um, in the past month and I absolutely love. Um, I've always been a girl that supports other girls. I think most people know me from that. I'm just a girl's girl. Um, and to be a part of a charity like this that is worldwide and that is not asking for money, it's asking for time is a whole different thing. It's actually bringing Alicia Keys and I back together again. She's in my documentary and apparently she's coming on board this too. And I think she's being asked right now to do the big song for this charity. But what we will do is we will find girls and women um, in all across the world, in every single country that um, deserve and need the opportunity be, to be mentored. And this is not just entertainment, this is science, technology, you name it, we're gonna mentor you. Um, and so we will find these deserving um, females and we will pair them with people that have made it, take each, each one of us, so to speak, and the woman that come on board will be paired with a, with a woman or young girl um, to mentor them to excel in their field. And you know what it is, we all have time. You know, if we don't have an extra dollar right now, I promise you we have time. So um, it, it's important. And I've always lived my life where, um, you know, I, I, I practice leaving a footprint and um, that's that's my path and so if i can leave a footprint for one girl let alone a million then my life is complete it's very important to me i love what you say about leaving a footprint and and this goes into my next question especially because a lot of young women and maybe possibly girls will be tuning in to this and what advice can you give a young woman who wants to get into entertainment, but with your life, you have, I mean, you have done wonderful things in entertainment, but you've left this footprint. So what kind of advice could you give a young girl who's thinking about this is what she wants to do next? Again, that's why this particular charity means so much to me, because if you were a young girl that wanted to be in entertainment, and let's say I was your mentor, um, it's, you just pick what, area of entertainment you want to get into. I I actually had a very young um, actress come into my office about four years ago. She was amazing, she blew me away. And she sat there, she was just an, on a general to meet me as, as um, an actress meeting a producer. The end of which she said to me, would you mentor me? She was one of the few girls actress wise that took uh, you know, a part of that. And, and um, my answer was wholeheartedly yes. And um, she's incredible. She's been on the show Empire for the past couple of seasons. She actually is the one that, if anybody watches Empire, she married one of the lion sons at the end of it. She's also a singer and just got a, um, a, you know, a, a management deal um, with Kendrick Lamar's label. And um, you know, the answer is we all have time to mentor somebody. Anybody trying to get in, pick your mentor. Um, 
you'd be surprised how many people will say yes. If you want to be a director, go find a director. If you want to be a writer, go search out that writer. If you want to be a DP, go find them. I promise you, you might have to do it for free for a while because mentors, you know, can't pay, but we're paying with our time. And if we can, can, you know, start the next generation to come on into our footsteps, why wouldn't we? Um, as a matter of fact, I, I, I always teach my crew and the people that work with me, I don't care who you're speaking to on the phone. I don't care if it's an assistant of somebody or an intern of somebody. Those people are going to go up one day while you're coming down and you're going to meet in the middle no matter what. So mentor everybody because you never know um, when you're going to run into them again and teach them again, leave your footprint. And, and everybody's got time. It's, it, it, it's an easier ask than money right now. So, um, but everybody's got time. I love it. I love it. Now, during our podcast, you talked a lot about what was happening next with you, but I, this is how I like to end all of my interviews. So there could be more that you haven't told us, but we want to know what's next for Cindy right. because your life is just so amazing. I have a lot of necks. Um, so I'm still on my charities, um, you know, Woman World Foundation, um, World Woman's Foundation, um, Little Kids Rock, which is a charity that gives musical instruments to underprivileged kids in um, school districts that don't have after school programs. Um, there's a charity that I love to support, I'm not on the board of, but um, yeah, um, it's called um, the Solar Suitcase, and we light up hospitals in third world countries um, so that they can continue having operations at night. It's a very important charity um, started by a female who I will ultimately bring into World's Woman Foundation or at least honor her because she deserves it. Um, Children Mending, Mending Hearts, which is right now um, trying to deliver as many meals as we can to seniors and disabled. Um, so I'll con continue my charity. Um, I'm also hopefully still producing the two movies for Sony. Um, one is a horror movie based on a true story of the first exorcist ever performed live on TV, um, way before the movie The Exorcist and any ghost movies came out. And then we go into something lighthearted, which is loosely based on InSync, the InSync biopic. Then we're doing a political thriller in India. And then we're doing a movie based on helicopter cops and how they're solving crimes quicker than anybody based here in Los Angeles. And then after that, I'm working with Viola Davis on an independent movie. So that's the movies right now. I'm also getting ready to do um, a TV show based on Ellis Island. It's very important for people to know that Ellis Island only happened 50 years ago. Um, it's an island right off New York City where immig immigrants at that time came through and what happened then and what could easily happen again right now. And then we go into unscripted. Um, one, we are about to relaunch Maxim Magazine, but not the way you would think, as a female empowerment magazine, um, which is how do you relaunch a sexy magazine in this era? You bring on a female, um, you bring on a female publisher, a female editor, and a female whatever, and we want to rebrand a, a, a name that was known in the past. And then something very near and dear to me, which is another TV show called Seekers. And it's about seeking the light in a world going dark. Right now, the world is trying to go dark on a lot of people. And I want to show all the different modalities that people are doing to stay in the light. And whatever your modality is, is good. I, 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 you know, everybody's got a different modality. It could be taking a vow of silence for days. It could be meditating. It could be um, fasting. It could be doing ayahuasca. It could be going to a shaman healer. There's so many different things that people are doing right now and we need to stay in the light. So whatever it is and whatever I can show people, um, that's what we're going to do. Before this pandemic, we were going to travel all around the world because the modalities used in Bali might be very different from the, from the modalities used in Africa versus the modalities used in the United States. So my thing is to show them all and hope that one of them resonates with the viewer. Wow. Well, so if I had the money, I would greenlight you right away for Seekers because <laughs> that is definitely something 
that we need right now. So, wow. I might even podcast in the meanwhile while we're waiting for the pandemic to end. It's just, yeah, it's very near and dear to me. And then I just went on the board of a beauty company to, to push everything aside. Um, I still want to help the world be a little bit more beautiful. And so I went on board a beauty company out of Dubai and um, something very different, but I've always been fascinated with beauty and cosmetics and um, just, again, different ways for people to feel beautiful when they might not. So I'm all over the place. Got to stay busy. Well, well, you know, actually, I was thinking you're so versatile, and I think that is wonderful advice. I mean, you already gave us advice before, but that's wonderful, wonderful advice for women because sometimes we think we have to be in just one thing, and when we have so many other talents, and so what you're you're teaching us is that we can explore all of our talents. Absolutely. Absolutely. It makes you more well-rounded. It makes you like, one of the things that's always driven me crazy a lot of times in my business of entertainment is that's all people want to talk about. And maybe because I started with news, I don't want to just talk about entertainment. I find it a little bit boring after a while. I don't really care, you know, who wrote what or who's sleeping with who or what director's doing what. I want to talk about the world. You know, I want to talk about news and politics, not in a bad way, um, in a good way. And I want to just educate myself with everything that's around. And I want to be a part of everything that's around. It keeps us fresh and exciting. And, um, you know, one of the things going back to this pandemic and now these riots, which is a shame, is we're not getting any other news. We're not getting anything else. It's 24 seven of this. And maybe that's designed and on purpose, but um, we can't spend 24 seven consumed with something that is so dark. We definitely need to know what it is, but going back to seekers, we have to be able to stay in the light. And that's why Angela meeting someone like you and even taking moments to do podcasts like this, they're important. I get to, I've been stuck in my house for 70 days now. I've only left my house three days. So um, I want to continue reaching out and seeing people around the world. Um, I want to meet new faces. I want to have different conversations. I want to learn something every day. So um, it's important. And that's what I say to anybody out there and anybody watching this. Get up every morning with the intention of learning one thing. What's happening to all of us is disheartening and depressing. And you know maybe there's a bigger agenda here, but let's not get caught up in it. We are, if anything, don't let them separate us. We've been separated by being confined to our homes. We've been separated by being isolated. We're now being separated by old against young and black against white and Democrats against Republicans. Let's not let them separate us. If there's one thing that we should be learning is, even with this pandemic, it's affecting everybody. Even with this horrible thing that just happened to, to George Floyd, it is affecting everybody. If we should learn one thing, it's that it should unite us, not divide us unite us not divide us that is what i am going to be preaching and hopefully leaving on and if we it's so important that's the one thing that i want to end these podcasts on and i can't stress it enough unite not divide no matter what they they whoever they is are trying to do um, we are all in this together no matter skin color socioeconomic whatever we might be in different boats but we're in the same boat um, some boats might be a little bit bigger than others, but we're all going to sink at the same time. So um, if we take care of each other and really take care of each other, and I want to highlight somebody good. I don't know the gentleman's name, but I was watching in Washington when the riots happened and people were being tear gassed and pepper sprayed and rubber bullets were coming. There was this amazing gentleman that I don't know if you guys saw, but when the curfew happened, he opened his doors and 70 people came into his house. And he let them sleep there for one night so they wouldn't get pepper sprayed and they wouldn't get the rubber bullets. And that man, that man is a role model and a hero and what we should all aspire to be. Seriously, um, we need to highlight more of these good people instead of just the bad. I love it. And it's the perfect way to end this podcast. Thank you so much, Cindy, for sharing your life, not only and with us, but just your light. <laughs> um, 
all of our listeners as well. You are just so amazing and your footprint is amazing too. And we could just, we could just all follow after you. <laughs> thank you. Well, again, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Angela Williamson for She Talks Cinema. And look for Cindy Cowan out there and also definitely stream Miracle on 42nd Street. You will definitely feel the light in that documentary. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everybody.